Now, remember last week, one of the things I said was some people think there's a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. I don't think there is because this is exactly the same kind of thing that you see when you switch from one disciple to another. One will call it kingdom of God. One will call it kingdom of heaven. Okay? Basically the same thing. Okay? But that's what those things in parentheses mean. So when you see that, don't let it throw you. Okay? So, um, let's just go ahead and start at Matthew 13, 8. It said, Then the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? They were wondering, Why are you doing this? Never used to do this. Why are you doing it now? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries. Mark says mystery of the kingdom of heaven. Mark says God. But to them it is not given. It's not given unto them to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Mark says, but unto them that are without, all things are done in parables. Okay? Now, so he's talking here to his disciples. Literally, that term disciples means learners. That's what his disciples were. They were people who were learning. Okay? And them that are without are those that are outside of the fellowship of those learners. When he says, unto them that are without, all things are done in parables, they weren't part of that fellowship. Not that they were being excluded, okay? The disciples were there of their own free will. Those that were without were, were outside of that fellowship, either out of ignorance or out of their own free will. Or maybe they were really, really, really busy and had busy jobs like we do and weren't able to come, but they were outside of that fellowship of the, of the disciples. And, but, so that's the possibilities, but Jesus makes it clear which one it was. He says in Matthew 13, 10, For whosoever receiveth, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. Whoever receives, they're going to get. But whoso continueth not to receive... From him shall be taken away even that he hath. So the difference here was that the people he was talking to in parables are those who continue not to receive. Continuing in something is an act of will. It's sustained. It's ongoing. And these people were people who were continuing not to receive. Okay? So then, he continues. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. Now this seems to be ignorance, but it's not ignorance. Jesus makes that clear. It's not ignorance. It's rebellion. Okay? Obviously they were not willing to receive, because it says, For whosoever receiveth to him shall be given. Okay? They were not willing to receive. The mysteries of the kingdom are not given to them because they won't receive those mysteries. They won't do it. Okay? And then Mark continues, says, says that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Luke says that seeing they may not, might not see and hearing they might not understand. Okay? So what it comes down to is they do not want to see and receive or hear and understand. Okay? Matthew makes that clear. He quotes from Isaiah next. And he says, this is the way it is with you folks. Okay? And he's making it clear. God's not going to violate their agency. God's not going to shove stuff down their throat. Okay? He's not going to violate their agency. And here's what he quoted from Isaiah, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah concerning them, which saith, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I would heal them. Okay? Now that word lest, lest at any time they should see. They did not want to understand. Okay? 
They have closed their eyes. They've stopped their ears. This is the condition of their heart. They, less means they're afraid of. They don't want to hear. They don't want to see. They do not want to understand. Okay? Their, their hearts are waxed gross. That word wax gross means made stout, made strong. Their hearts are waxed gross. They're not just wimpy little hearts. These are hearts that are stout. Okay? They're calloused. Okay? They do not want to hear or see or understand or be converted. They're saying, I don't want it. I don't want you to change my heart. I'm just fine. I don't need to be changed. Okay? So God is not going to give them easy understanding because their lack of understanding is their choice. You do not reach a rebellious person by appealing to his intellect. Jesus could have argued with them all day long. And he had the tools to do it. But he was dealing with their hearts, and their hearts had to change. Not their mind, their hearts. This was intentional on their part. They did not want to be converted. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. And blessed are you because these things are come unto you that you might understand them. Okay? Again, God has not shut their ears and their eyes and their hearts. God didn't do that. They did it. They have done this to themselves. God merely recognized this. When the eyes and ears are open, God gives. When the eyes and ears are closed, he withdraws. He withholds. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables as they were able to bear, and without a parable spake he not unto them. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouths in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now, this is why the teaching changed at the third year. This is why it changed from open teaching to parables, okay? Jesus had taught for two years, and he had taught very openly about, you look at the Sermon on the Mount, you understand what's there. You read through that, it's pretty easy to understand. Whether you buy it or not is up to you, but it's pretty easy to understand, okay? In addition to that, all of his teaching was accompanied by miracles, he was going around healing people and casting out demons and raising the dead and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, Nicodemus recognized that. He said, no man could do the things that you do unless God is with him. Okay? So it was clear. Nicodemus was a teacher of the Jews. Nicodemus was an honest teacher of the Jews. Okay? But what happened was, here this was being demonstrated Beautiful teachings done with power. His, God, his, his being sent from God was being demonstrated by his works. And what were they saying? Well, you cast out demons by Beelzebub. Okay? They, they were ascribing what he did to being empowered by Satan, despite the fact that there was all the evidence in front of him. And that resistance became so great. Third year, he just basically shut it down. And he said, I'm going to give it to you now in parables. Okay? Uh, it had become obvious that most people weren't going to listen. And that's why he switched to parables. Okay? And then he said, and except you repent, the preaching of John shall condemn you in the day of judgment. And again, hear another parable, for unto you that believe not, I speak in parables, that your unrighteousness may be rewarded unto you. Okay, so that's a call to repentance. He said, you're going to reap what you have sown. Speaking in parables was a judgment on them. It says, when they were alone, he expounded all things unto his disciples, because his disciples were willing to listen. Okay? Now I'm going to just say here, parables by the nature of parables, what they were intended to do. They were intended to obscure. What does that mean? Well, if you look at Jesus' teachings in his last year of ministry, most of them are in parables, so we kind of struggle with that. 
Parables are difficult to understand. Jesus expounded them to his disciples because they wanted to understand some of those expositions we have in the Gospels. Okay? Uh, some of them we don't, and it's going to take some work on our part to understand what he's saying. Don't expect that the interpretations will always be easy. He's obscuring here. Okay? Parables ensure that the meaning is not apparent. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to study carefully. We're going to have to listen to the Spirit and seek the Spirit. Okay? They can't be read superficially. That's what the Jews were doing. They were reading them superficially. You're going to have to be willing to dig deep. Okay? You're going to have to work at this. It's not something you're just going to be able to sit there. You're going to have to engage your mind. Now, I'm just going to throw a caution out here. I've done my best to try to figure out what these parables mean. I may be wrong. Okay? So, if you don't, please don't hesitate to disagree with me. Okay? If you raise your hand and say, I don't think that's right, I'm going to listen to you. Because I recognize that <laughs> I may not have it right. You might. The Spirit works with you just as much as he works with me. So let's come to these understandings together. Okay? So, there are in the scriptures a, a, a little over 30 paragraphs, some, uh, 30 parables, somewhere between 30 and 40 parables in the scriptures. About 20 of them are kingdom parables. The kingdom of God is like. Okay? And, and what I want to concentrate here mainly on is the kingdom parables. Now, once in a while, I'll touch on a different one. But I'm getting so picky about this that, um, you know, I really want to focus on those kingdom parables. Uh, there's a script, there, if you read the parable, parable about the tower, that's about the redemption of Zion, okay? I don't think Zion and the kingdom are necessarily synonymous, okay? So like I, as you'll see on one of the sheets I'm going to hand out to you, I just say there, this is for a different class, okay? I want to speak to the ones primarily that deal with the kingdom. Now, having said that, I'm going to not do that, okay? Uh, what I want to do is get into a parable here, um, and this parable is not about the kingdom, but it gives us some principles about interpreting parables. It doesn't state those principles, but you're going to have to flesh them out with me, okay? But let's just look at them here. Okay, so this is from the book of Matthew. You have parallel versions in Mark 4, 1 through 19, and Luke 8, 5 through 18. And he starts out here and it says, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? Now that word know means what? Anybody? It means understand. Don't you understand this parable? If you can't understand this parable, how are you going to understand any parable? Okay, now Jesus is saying one of two things here. Okay, either, either he's saying that this parable is key to understanding all parables, that there are things in here that are going to point you in the right direction when it comes to parables, or Jesus is saying, if you don't understand a parable that's this easy, you don't have a prayer of understanding the others. Okay, now I hope that he's saying the first one because I struggled with these parables, <laughs> okay? And I hope it's not just because uh, uh, I'm just dense, okay? I'm hoping he's saying, here's some keys. Here's some helps here. Look for principles in this parable. Okay, so he starts out. And this is the parable of the sower. And I put in here, this is with the interpretation. So what I've done here is, like I said before, in parentheses you will have from alternate versions. When there's an interpretation of that, I go ahead and indent it. So whenever you see those indentations, that's an interpretation. Okay? So let's just start down through this. And he spake many things 
unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Okay? And Mark says, The sower soweth the word. Luke says, The seed is the word of God. So this is Jesus interpreting his parable. So the word of God was sown. Okay? Now, um, I had it suggested to me that whenever you see the, a, a word used in a parable, it means the same thing in all the other parables. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think it's a good principle to kind of lean on a little bit, but be careful. Okay, here the good seed, uh, here the seed is the word of God. If you look in the parable of the tares, the good seed is the children of the kingdom. Okay, so it's not always the same. Uh, birds have different meanings in this parable than they do in the parable of the mustard seed. Okay, so you've just got to be a little bit, look for consistency, but don't expect it to be 100% between parables because that can throw you off. Okay. But you expect some consistency or everything is gobbledygook. Okay? So Matthew 13, 4 says, And when he sowed, this is the sower, some seeds fell by the wayside, Luke says, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air came and devoured them up. And then Jesus interprets that for us. He says, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. And then Luke adds to that, that which fell by the wayside are they who hear, and the devil cometh. Um, Mark says immediately, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So Satan's always about that. He's always wanting us not to believe. He doesn't want us to be saved. Okay? Now, what you will find here with this parable of the sowers is that God is talking about classes of people, groups of people. And you've been around people like this, okay, who fall in this category. You talk to them about the gospel, and they might show a little bit of interest, and then you just kind of see the veil go over their eyes. And you might as well be talking to a brick wall. Yes. Right back there, need a mic. I was just thinking, um, could this also mean maybe someone who hears or you're like you're sharing with them, but they just let themselves get distracted? So not necessarily forget, but just other things are more important, you know, to them than that? Yeah. I'm not arguing. I'm just no, like, no. oh, that's another idea. I don't know. Yeah, no. <laughs> like I said, don't feel because you bring up a possible other understanding. Don't feel that you're arguing with me. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. Um, later on in one, of the, in one of the other parts of this they talk about how easy it is to get distracted okay so they might fall in this category depending on whether they're disciples or not disciples can also fall in that category okay so uh, you know basically he's just saying uh, here's this group of people sometimes they don't understand they hear it and they go, huh? Because face it, the natural man is an enemy to God. We don't understand the things of God very much. God has to do a work in our heart. We have to want to understand. Okay? And when we want to understand, he changes our hearts and we begin to receive. Well, these ones, for either they don't understand or they just don't care, then that group of people here who are not receiving. And the analogy that he uses is that's like the seeds fall by the wayside, it gets stomped on, the birds come and eat it, and does it ever turn into what it's supposed to turn into? Never. Never. Okay? It gets killed right at the beginning. The seeds don't even sprout. Okay? So, the next one. Some fell upon stony places. Luke says, upon a rock. For they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, and when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no deepness of earth, and because they had no root, they withered away. And Luke adds, because it lacked moisture. 
You have to have moisture to grow. Okay? And Matthew comes back then later on when Jesus interprets this for them and he says, But they that receive the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and readily, Mark says immediately, with joy receiveth it, yet it hath not root in himself and endureth but for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, immediately, by and by, that means straightway, straightway he is offended. And one of the, one of the ways of translating that is he, he is snared. Okay? So here you've got people that's a little bit different. The seed actually took root. Yes? No, I was just going to say that... Matthew 13, 19 just sticks out like a sore thumb right now, and I think it speaks a lot to um, many people who've, per, you know, perhaps grown up in the church or grown up and have heard of the gospel, but they just did not have that root. And they've endured for a little while and then get distracted, and then I, just that last piece is just, that is such human nature right there. It's by and by so easily offended, and it also... You know, you read in Matthew 24, it talks about the last days too, and it talks about how man is so easily offended. And so I really, really appreciate the direction of this and how this really ties in a lot with um, uh, just human nature to an extent, but yeah. also speaks to a lot of the climate that we have right now. Yeah. How many times I have seen, and I know people like this too, so it's not just out there in Hollywood. Okay, I have some people very close to me who, don't worry, it's not Gene. <laughs> don't get me wrong. Okay, uh, but I know people very close to me. I see this with Hollywood stars all the time. You, find, you see a Hollywood star and you say, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. And then a year later, they're back to the way it always was. So discouraging. And yet they did with joy initially receive it. But it didn't get watered. And it just dried up. And in the end, it's just as dead as if the seed had never taken root. Okay, what a sad state. But this is another class of people. Initially, they receive it with joy. And then it just dies. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprung up and choked them. Okay, Matthew says it yielded no fruit. Okay, now what that choke means, okay, what do thorns do? Any of you who are gardeners, what happens when you get weeds in your garden? What does it take away from the plant? Steals their nutrients, doesn't it? Steals the water, steals their nutrients. And so you might have plants there, but they never do what they're supposed to do. They just kind of sit there stunted, okay, and they never produce fruit. That's why you've got to keep your garden weeded. I tell myself every year, okay, you've got to keep that garden weeded if you want to have fruit, okay? And here's what's happening is they're being choked out by the thorns. And then Jesus said, he also who receiveth seed, and Mark says, who receiveth the word, among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Okay, and this is kind of coming back to your comment there. Okay? And Luke adds a couple of other things, and so does Mark. And the pleasures of life and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. And Luke adds, and bring no fruit to perfection. Okay? Now, folks, this is believers here we're dealing with. Okay? This is so easy to happen for us. Okay? There are so many distractions. I love when you put all these scriptures together. Look at what he says. The care of this world. You got all these burdens you're carrying. The care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. You've seen that happen to people where riches have pulled them away from the gospel. And pleasures of life. You've seen them get involved. In them. They're still, they call themselves Christians or nominally Christians, but they're so involved in the pleasures of life that somehow 
the gospel never shines through. And the lusts of other things entering in, okay? Lust is a terrible thing. And I'm not just talking about physical lust here. I'm talking about lust for anything. It's a terrible thing because it chokes out our spiritual life. All these things do. If you get yourself, if you are so, this is why it's so important to always come back to the Lord and be nourished by him. Okay? Because it is so easy for us for the cares of the world to overcome us. It is so easy for us to get distracted. Okay? And Jesus knew that. And he said, don't be part of this. Try not to let this happen to you. And here's the good part. Okay? But the others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit. Mark says that sprang up and increased. Some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. And he said unto them, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Okay? God wants us to bring forth fruit. Now remember what was sown here. What was sown in the beginning here? What was the seed? The Word of God. Okay? That can be the Word of God by the Spirit. That can be Word of God by the Scriptures. Doesn't matter. It's one and the same God and one and the same source. Okay? He wants that seed to take root in us. Because the Word of God transforms us. Un transforms our minds, transforms our hearts, okay? The word of the God never passes away, okay? If we hear and obey the word of God, we're going to bear fruit. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth and endureth. Mark says, and receive it. Luke says, in an honest and good heart. Having heard the word, keep what they hear. It's not just enough to hear the word of the Lord. You've got to keep it. You've got to cherish it. You've got to let it change you, motivate you, stimulate you. Okay? And bringeth forth some in hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So the word is how we know God's will. By his spirit, by his word. That's how we know his will. Our purpose in this world is to bear fruit. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's the expectation. It's not an option. If you're not bearing fruit, you're in that last category. Where here your spindly little plants are, and they're there, and they're alive, but are they doing any good to anybody? Are people able to harvest that fruit? Okay, is it having an impact on those around you? Is it nurturing them? Is it nourishing them? God wants us to bear fruit. Okay? Now, I have, I'm going to give out to you, not right now, but in a little bit, I'm going to give you a summary of the parables. Oh my, we only have 10 minutes left. Oh, oh, oh. I talk too much. Ah. Okay. What are some of the principles? Can you see any principles in, the, in this parable? Because he said, by this you can know, understand all parables. What are some things you notice in this parable that might be principles that will help us understand the parables? Jesus said at the beginning of this, if you don't understand this parable, how can you understand any parables? Okay. So there must be some things in this parable. Either it's a very easy to one to understand or there are some principles in here that we can help glean understanding from the other parables. Okay? I, I will throw out two of them to you. Okay? One is that this parable has to do with our relationship with God. Okay? And I think every parable falls in that category. That's a principle. You look at it and you say, what is this trying to tell me about my relationship with God? The second is it talks about my attitudes and my motivations. Okay? The, many of the parables do that. 
They talk about what God is and it talks about what we are. Okay? So those are two principles. Okay? Another principle is that God is pretty consistent through the parable about what it means. He's not going to say something in the first paragraph and then say in the last paragraph I change the meaning on you. Okay? You've got to have consistency through that or it doesn't mean anything. Right? Anything else that you saw in there? Yes. Aubrey. Um, what stands out to me is the um, idea that it has to do with our relationship with others as well. I think it's really important that I, I know people that fall into every single one of these categories. And for me, um, in this last one, to be able to bear fruit, I think, is important to... Um, nourish a relationship with, with my family and with my friends that helps them to bear fruit also. Uh-huh. And that's what the fruit is all about, isn't it? Okay? We should be nourishing and nurturing others. Okay? Great. Great comment. Here's one. Okay. Who's closest? Get that one first and sorry, you're next. <laughs> I think he always shows us the benefit he shows us the benefit of following his way. Okay. And the reverse also. <laughs> okay. But, but he always tells the benefit. Great. It seems to me that God wants to save everyone's soul, not just the one that has good soil. Okay. Yeah, you know, this is... This is the thing that we've got to keep clear as we go through this. It's so easy to, say, to look at this and say, oh, I'm that person who got distracted by the cares of the world. And we're down on ourselves. But what, did script, what does Scripture say about the kingdom of God? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Okay, Becky, would you share what you shared with me last week about at hand. Okay, now literally that at hand means near. But Becky had a take on that that I thought was a valuable take. Well, I was sitting here and, and I was thinking about that term, the kingdom of God is at hand. And I was, and I was thinking about, you know, the veil is so... There is a kingdom. There is a king. There are angels. There are principalities. And, and we often think of them as far, far away. And yet the veil is so thin. Uh, people that are ready to go on to the next life can see through that veil and, and can see, see it so close. And when I, and when I thought about that, the kingdom of God, he kept saying, he keeps saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. And, and when we, um, I need both my hands to do this. When we reach up to him, he is ready to reach down to us. The kingdom of God is at hand. We can call on his angels. We can call on him to help. We can call, we can... He says that, that those that believe will cast out demons, will heal the sick, will raise the dead. The kingdom of God is at hand. Doesn't that excite you? Yeah. It excites me. <laughs> okay. Who else? There's one. I was thinking about this a few months ago. I heard a class or something, and I realized that um, I always used to, when I'd hear this parable, I would put people in those categories or just, you know, generally people, not like specific people. But then I realized when I was thinking about it, I find myself in every single one of these categories at either different parts of my life or in different parts of the gospel. Like, I'll really be doing well with this one thing, but in this other thing, I'll have thorns and, you know, being distracted and stuff like that. And so when I thought about that, I was like, wow, that's like totally different because a person can have the good ground and be producing fruit and all of this, and then they can start to let the weeds grow and they can start to have the thorns coming in and get distracted and they're not studying their scriptures. They aren't 
watering their ground and then they're why am I all dried up why am I shriveled up in my spiritual life and like that's what I've noticed about myself is like I'll be in these I, it's kind of like a vicious seasonal cycle of <laughs> I'll just be doing one or the other sometimes so um, that's just another thought all right I need is there a deacon around who can hand something out for me here or somebody who'd be willing to do this Scott thank you just make sure everybody gets one. There should be enough for everybody here. <laughs> Ken, I'd like okay. to make a comment real quick. Go ahead. Um, when you're talking the first week about the kingdom of God being near, I thought it was so apropos that the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ in that instance, and that he was walking amongst them, and they still didn't recognize him as being there. And then when we talked about the, the qualifications of a kingdom, we always think of, of, a, of a, like a, a land or a place or something like that, but the kingdom that he wanted to rule is our individual hearts. Okay. All right, now, I want to say this. I'm going to follow up on what Gary said a little bit ago. I think it's really, really important, okay? And that is, you know, every analogy, we learn this in logic class, okay? Every analogy breaks down. Okay? And the parables are an analogy. And they're going to break down eventually. Okay? Just like any analogy does. You just can't, you know, unless you're repeating yourself, it's not going to be the same. It will break down. Now, this is an analogy that does break down. Here's where it breaks down. Yes, there are people there who the seed was thrown out to them and they just blew it off. And the seed died and got eaten. Okay? There are people there who started joyfully and then they didn't get enough water and they died. There are people there who loved the Lord, but they got so caught up in the joys of the world, or not joys of the world, but the cares of the world, and lusts and all those kind of things that they just got stunted in their growth. Okay? The thing about this is, with repentance, God restores. That's what you got to remember. And that person who blew it off may very well reach the point where if a faithful saint witnesses to them and cares about them and shares with them, it may take root and get watered. Okay? That one plant that died, you know, in the real world, that dead plant is dead. Okay? But in, in the real, real world, that dead plant can be brought to life again. And that's the place of repentance. You know, everybody thinks that repent for the kingdom of God is at hand means don't beat your breast and say how bad you are and everything else. That's not what it's saying. It says turn back to God. The kingdom of God is at hand. And all those people that are in all those categories can come back to him. They can respond. They can grow. They can bear fruit hundredfold, okay? That can happen. So never, never, never forget that. That just because somebody blows you off doesn't mean you stop witnessing. I, read a, I heard a testimony on YouTube not too long ago. I've got one minute left, so I'm just going to have to be fast. Where this guy witnessed to his father-in-law for 35 years. And his father-in-law had a stroke and was going into surgery for this stroke. And he... He had the chance to spend two hours with him. And he was talking to him and he saw tears. And his father-in-law turned to the Lord. He died shortly thereafter, but that turn to the Lord was genuine. 35 years he had witnessed to him. But eventually, the seed grew. That's what we've got to remember in all of this. Now, I've handed out here to you some sheets. And I'm going to quit because I'm one of the first one who gets mad at teachers who go over. Uh, but I hand you out some sheets here who are succinct summaries of the parables of the kingdom. Okay? By succinct, I mean I made them as short as I possibly could. And I, by doing so, I left a lot out. I recognize that. Here, I've got an assignment for you. I don't want this class to be just me up here talking. Okay? I want to hear from you too. So here's your assignment. 
I want you to go through these parables and I want you to pick one. And I want you to study that parable out. Try to come to an understanding of what the Lord is saying here in that parable and be ready when we come together next week to share what you've told me. Because I'm a firm believer that the Lord works through all the members of the body to bless the body. Okay? And I, just one parable is all you have to worry about. But spend your week on that and the alternative readings and all that kind of stuff. Look at it all and say, and see what the Lord tells you about what that parable means. And if you think my summary is off, tell me. I don't care. Okay? Tell me I don't think that's what it's saying at all. That's fine. But do that. Choose a parable. Be ready to come back. But when you come back, maybe we'll have 15 people on one parable, but more likely we'll have the Lord will touch you in the way he touches us, and he'll touch your heart toward one parable or another. And by the time we get through, all of these parables are going to be important. Okay? So do that for next week. Now the one thing I'm going to tell you is I get the parable of the mustard seed. Okay, that's the very first paragraph, parable you're going to hear about next time is the mustard seed. Okay, that's mine. And I'm going to talk about that and spend about 10 minutes on it probably. And then we're going to open it up for your parables and what touched you. Okay? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time we've had together. Might your words sink deeply into our hearts. Not the word, Father, that I shared, but the word that was shared through your scriptures and through your spirit. Father, let that word of God take root in our hearts and grow and bear fruit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.